Okay, welcome back. Let's continue our discussion. The most important thing for us about semiconductors is the behavior of the free carriers. So let's discuss free carriers. So what do we mean by free carriers? Remember, we have holes in the valence band and electrons in the conduction band, and they are free to move about in the semiconductor lattice and to conduct current. And this is what we're interested in in the operation of semiconducting devices. So the questions we have is, what are the properties of these electrons in the conduction band? We need to know a little bit about them. What are the properties of the holes, which we think of as positive charge carriers that move about the crystal lattice in the valence band? So let's talk, let's begin by discussing a simpler problem. Let's think of a free electron in vacuum. So this electron has a mass, we'll call it a rest mass, M0, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms. We call it the rest mass because that's what the mass is as long as it's not moving at relativistic speeds. You may recall from your freshman physics that electric fields exert forces on charged particles. The force on this electron is minus Q times the electric field. Remember that Q, in semiconductor work, we, just, we denote Q as the magnitude of the charge on an electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And remember that the actual charge is negative, so we write the actual charge as minus Q. There are different conventions used in different communities, so but this is the convention that is typically used by semiconductor people. Okay, so if we exert a force, then we push the, elect the electron, the electron then accelerates, it behaves according to Newton's laws, force is equal to mass times acceleration, as long as we don't have relativistic effects to worry about. And as the electron moves, then we could compute its velocity as a function of time and its position as a function of time, all with Newton's laws of motion. Okay. Now, we have a much more complicated situation that we're dealing with here. We have electrons in the conduction band that are wandering around this crystal lattice and they are experiencing all kinds of Coulomb forces due to the bonds and the, crisp and the uh, atoms and due to the other um, electrons and the holes. And it's a really a, a quite a complicated problem. How do you describe the motion of an electron in a crystal lattice? So this is something I'm only going to describe to you how it is done. It is one of the triumphs of condensed matter physics that it turns out that there is an especially simple way to do this which preserves the use of Newton's law and makes life really simple. So for a classical particle, we would have F is equal to MA. For electrons in a crystal lattice, as long as they're behaving as classical particles, and sometimes there are quantum mechanical effects that we'll talk about in Unit 2, but oftentimes, most of the time, they behave as classical particles, and all of these complicated forces that act upon the electron in a crystal lattice, we can wrap into something that we call an effective mass. Once we have wrapped everything into an effective mass, that accounts for all of these complications, and now we can use Newton's laws to compute the motion of electrons in the crystal. So, for example, in silicon, the effective mass of an electron is just a little bit heavier than its rest mass in vacuum. In gallium arsenide, the effective mass is much lighter than the uh, rest mass of an electron in vacuum. We understand how to compute these properties very well. They can be measured very well. As far as we're concerned in this course, we're simply going to accept the fact that we can describe electrons and holes in a crystal lattice according to, by using Newton's laws as long as we use the appropriate effective mass for that particular semiconductor. So those of you that are interested in diving deeper, you can find a lot about this in other textbooks or information on the web, but we'll keep it at this level for this course. Same thing occurs in holes. Holes we can think of as a positively charged particle that moves around, and we can think of them as having some effective mass. Their effective mass in general, the whole effective mass will be different from the 
electron effective mass. The whole effective mass might be larger than the electron effective mass or it might be smaller. It depends on the particular properties of the semiconductor. But these effective masses we will consider to be known to us. We'll look them up and rely on measurements that have been done or calculations that have been done uh, for the specific numerical values. Okay. Now, another concept that I want to mention at this point, and then we'll revisit in the next unit and get a little more comfortable with, is the relation between energy and momentum. So you'll recall, for a free particle in vacuum, um, energy is one-half mv squared. That's the kinetic energy. Momentum is mass times velocity. So I could write the energy as p squared divided by 2 times the mass. If I plotted then energy versus momentum, I'd have a parabola, just p squared divided by 2 times the mass. This is what it would look like for a free electron in vacuum. I also could write f equals ma equivalently as f equals dp dt. The force is the time rate of change of the momentum. So this is for a classical particle. We have these complicated electrons and holes inside a crystal lattice. It turns out that we can plot energy versus momentum in a similar way. So the energy is one-half effective mass times velocity squared, or momentum squared divided by two times the effective mass. So for common semiconductors, we can often describe energy versus momentum as a parabola, just as for a free particle. But the momentum or the crystal momentum is a, is a little bit more complicated. And again, we'll talk about this a little more in Unit 2. We're going to write the momentum as h bar k. And that's because electrons are both particles and waves. This is one of the things that was learned in quantum mechanics. Electrons behave both as particles and as waves. As waves, they have a wavelength or they have a wave number. The wave number is just defined as 2 pi over the wavelength. And it turns out that the momentum of an electron, of a free electron wave, the momentum is just h bar times that wave number k. So we'll often, we will usually talk about plotting energy versus k rather than energy versus momentum, but it's very similar. Force for a classical particle is dp dt. We would write force as d h bar k dt. So these are some concepts that are likely new to you at this stage. We'll talk about them a little more in Unit 2. And as long as we get comfortable with some basic concepts, we'll be able to accomplish a lot in this course. Just a reminder also that we introduced Planck's constant earlier. h bar is simply Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. Okay, now we have electrons in the conduction band, we have holes in the valence band, and we've seen that we can write the energy versus momentum for electrons in the conduction band as the bottom of the conduction band plus its kinetic energy, p squared over 2m. This is how we describe energy versus momentum for a conduction band. What about the valence band? Well, the valence band bends down. Remember, it has to bend down with increasing momentum because the states are all below the top of the valence band. Now, if you think about what's going on here, think about me creating a hot electron. I indicated earlier how that could be done by absorbing light with a very high energy. That hot electron is going to be high in the conduction band. Within a few femtoseconds, it will relax down to the lowest energy that it can relax to, which is the bottom of the conduction band. Uh, what if I create a hot hole? Well, if I create a hot hole, it's deep in the valence band. But the electrons in the valence band then are going to drop down and fill that hole, so the hole will move up. And within a few femtoseconds, the hole will be near the top of the valence band. And again, I'll be left with this situation that after a few femtoseconds, all of the electrons are near the bottom of the conduction band. All of the holes are near the top of the valence band. OK, so when we do plots like this, we're going to call these plots band structure plots. I'd indicated earlier that there are two different types of semiconductors. There are semiconductors that emit light when electrons and holes recombine. And I mentioned that those are called direct gap semiconductors. Well, let's explain what a direct gap semiconductor is. A direct gap semiconductor is just one that has the properties 
uh, as we've drawn here. It means in a direct gap semiconductor, the minimum of the conduction band and the maximum of the valence band occur at the same momentum. So when an electron and a hole recombine, it's an electron and a hole with the same momentum. These are direct gap semiconductors, semiconductors like gallium arsenide. They have a very useful property. They emit light when carriers recombine. Now I'll just mention as an aside before we move on that we, we are talking about here about band structure. Band structure is energy versus momentum or energy versus crystal momentum or this quantity K, 2 pi over the wavelength. An energy band diagram we drew earlier. An energy band diagram is simply the bottom of the conduction band versus position and the top of the valence band versus position. We will talk about most of these, but as the course progresses, energy band diagrams will become more and more useful to us. Okay, now we have talked about two types of semiconductors. There are direct gap semiconductors where recombination processes lead to the emission of light. I also mentioned that semiconductors like silicon are called indirect gap semiconductors. Recombination processes don't tend to emit light. How do we draw a indirect gap semiconductor on an energy band diagram? Well, it looks something like this. This is an energy band diagram where the bottom of the conduction band and the top of the valence band occur at different momentum. This makes it particularly difficult for electrons and holes to recombine in a way that gives off light. They tend to recombine in a way that gives off heat rather than light. So this is what we mean by an indirect gap semiconductor. Minimum of the conduction band, maximum of the valence band occur at two different momenta. All right, so again, we've covered a lot of ground. If it seems like a lot to you, don't be overly concerned. We'll revisit these concepts and have a chance to get more and more familiar with them as the course develops. So we've talked a little bit about the properties of electrons in the conduction band. These electrons are free to move about the crystal and carry currents. And they can often and commonly be treated as Newtonian particles as long as we give them an effective mass that accounts for all of the complicated interactions with the crystal potential itself. Holes in the valence band we can also think of as particles, positively charged particles that are free to move about within the crystal and conduct current. They can often be treated as Newtonian particles with a different effective mass and we will regard these effective masses as quantities that are known that we can look up from previous measurements or from theoretical calculations. Okay, we still have not talked about the most important properties of semiconductors, which is the ability to dope them and to reproducibly change their electronic properties in ways that make it beneficial uh, for the operation of specific electronic devices. That's the subject of the next lecture.